David King, hello. Morning, G. We're almost there. Almost there. Almost there. <laughs> Thursday night, eh? Yeah, it should be should be a fantastic final series. Can't uh, can't wait to see what unfolds and what comes from left of centre. There'll be there'll be a couple of you know random events that uh, that throw all of our tips out of out of whack again, like they've done all year. The the allocating of categories will tell its own story here. So just before we do, are you in? They they got that right or they got that wrong with the with the persistence with the pre finals buy. I, I don't love it. I, I love the Thursday night final. So you've sort of got to give something to get something. Um, but I just think this weekend could be used better. I, I, I do think you need to give AFLW clear air as well. So I don't know how it all works out, but I would have loved the Brownlow last night. Yeah, just to just to really get us rolling into finals, full stop the home and away, and then and then then charge again. Just such a such a great night. We have to wait till grand final week when there's so many other things to talk about. Like the grand final should be the clear air, not the not the brown low for me. Um, but there's, I think I'm in the minority there. Mm, don't know, don't know. The means test. Thanks to Jamison Irish whiskey. Gather round. Give us a king's gambit to get us energised. Well, the more I'm looking at these games and these matchups and, and and what's going to separate them and how how fine line most of them are and. Everyone at this stage of the year has a reason they can win the game. If this happens, they'll take control. If that happens, they're in trouble. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a point of difference. There's an area of dominance. Um, it can be personnel. It can be player. It can be system. It can be a whole host of different things. It can be all of those things. And you just need performance in the end. Um, but the more I look at it, the more I think this is going to you know give us what history has always shown us that in the end, in these small margin games. And as crazy it is, the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's at forward 50 stoppages or defensive 50 stoppages, which is probably more the point, is going to dictate the result. I mean, we've seen it, we've seen it year on year, forward 50 stoppages, you know, they are the dotting of the I's and crossing the T's in the AFL landscape. And if I put my, my flag in the ground, I'll say that it'll be a midfielder that'll get lazy at a stoppage and all of a sudden one step becomes two, becomes the, the margin that gives an opportunity in front of goals. And... There are some teams that don't defend well, and there's some teams that score. So I'm looking at best versus best. So we're trimming all the, the junk numbers, if you like. So if you look at the teams that do score from forward 50 stoppages, number one against the best has been the Dogs. Number two has been Sydney. Three, GWS, and four, Port Adelaide. Now, they're probably the best four teams across the season, aren't they, really, in particularly in the back half of the year. Um, and in last final series, so always looking back to see what we could learn, Last final series, Brisbane, eight scores from stoppage, Collingwood and GWS, six. In the final series. In the finals. Yep. So they're not massive numbers, but they have a huge impact. They're almost that, those those gift goals. Um, I was also, So you remember the Luke Paul goal. You remember the Gary Ablett goal. You, you remember those goals because they were, they were big moments at a late in game sort of stages. But you forget a lot too. And I, I, I was watching – I went back to have a look at the um, – the 2022 grand final. I was just having a look at Patrick Dangerfield, right? So everyone spent their week off, weekend off in different ways. You yeah. Back to the 2022 grand final. I just wanted to, because I just, I just have this, this thought process that if he, it was, it was a Dangerfield chat that I was going to have, right? If he does this again, what, what does that do to Thursday night? Right. That was where I was going. And his first quarter was so powerful and good. You sort of have to see a couple of those. You sort of have to see a couple of those moments to, to believe them. But you you wouldn't believe how the first two goals were scored. Tom Hawkins pushing the opposition ruckman out of the way, and snapping from forward fifty stoppages, two goal lead away they go. So I'm thinking, are we just we just have to, you have to watch this facet of the game, and there's no greater stress than being on a Tom Papley or being on a Toby Green or being on a Cody Waitman, you know, those type of guys at those forward 50 stoppages. So I just want to put a flag in the ground this week and say, all those defenders out there and all those midfielders that are going to go back, you got to get the job done. Because if you don't, it, it, there's a, there's a, it's long-term pain. You lose a prelim by a forward 50 stoppage, long-term pain. Um, so so the, the next three to four weeks, it's going to bring us so many highlights and so many points of difference 
But that forward 50 stoppage is one that you never get over, Jared. That's the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's when you get to this point of the season. All right, that's the King's Gambit to get the juices flowing. The, the big issue does settle on what Carlton is going to do at selection, doesn't it? And it's the source of enormous intrigue. There's the players who will naturally be fit and ready to come back and how they perform first up. There's the middle bracket who are undeclared for the moment. And then there's the, do, the, do you have the imagination for Sam Doherty? So it's a big selection period for Carlton. So can we start at, at, at the number? So how many is too many is, is, is everyone's question. And th- they'll pick themselves, right? They'll either be right to go or they won't. And, and they'll, they'll be an individual case-by-case case discussion with the medical and the, and the coach. And in the end, the coach has to make the call. We've seen this go wrong. We've seen Sam Reid in a grand final. We've seen Phil Davis in a grand final. Not right. Cost your team big time in the biggest game. So this so is... There's no actual number, is it? It's, it's each individual case. Case by case. Yeah. But then you get, a, you get a collective risk, don't you? If you take six risks, you're bound to lose, you know, you're bound to roll snake eyes on one of them, Jared. So how many, how many snake eyes are you prepared to, to wear? If you, if you take a risk on six, there's a high likelihood you'll have one. There's probably a fair chance you'll have two that won't be able to see out the game. And it doesn't mean they're injured. They just won't be able to finish the game at full rat power. So th- there's there's a discussion there. I, I I sort of think if you're setting – so I'm always the believer of set, the coach is setting the group up, right? If you didn't play one because you just weren't sure and the players thought, hang on, he's not – prepared to roll the dice on him. Okay, he's he's talking about him being available next week. That sharp that that can sharpen the group. That can okay, well because I just don't feel like he's going to pick them all. I, I, in the back of my mind I'm thinking Voss he's he's not going to pick them all. He's just not. And I I think the one that he will pick is Sam Doherty because of the emotional investment and engagement that has with the group. That well, here we go. He's been charging at this opportunity. He's got to the line. He's done what he's done the last few weeks. Can you imagine him coming on a sub you know, halfway through the you know, third quarter? Get, you know, not necessarily game in the balance, but just what it would do for the group, regardless of what the scoreboard sort of says. If you're in the game, it gives you a huge fill-up. If you're, if you're a goal in front or two goals, his leadership coming on, the crowd going crazy. Like, the little things that you, you have to factor in, the, the investment of the, the journey with this group, do you sort of know where I'm going? I know where you're going. Yeah. yeah, the emotional uplift of it all. Yeah, and then if it was to go wrong, what's the how deflating or how crushing would that be? So you have to measure both of those. If you come on a sub, it probably can't go wrong. Yep, you wouldn't think. I mean, you touch wood and all those sorts of things, but yeah, I, we think there's we think there's three or four easy decisions this week, and then the rest are probably a bit a bit tougher. Mm. Always worry about Ruckman coming back in after layoffs like this. So that's, uh, wait and see how, wait and see how it unfolds. It, it's, it's such a big part of what Carlton's preparation is. Here's Patrick Cripps, the Blues captain, as they look towards playing finals for a second year in a row. I love the way they're speaking, Carlton. It's the, you know, they're on the, they're on the charge as a group and all, you know, together and all that sort of stuff. The last two weeks have provided a lot of heart and soul, Carlton, you know, their leaders have had to stand up. It's forced their leaders to get front of cue and and lead and actually take charge of their role and support others. Cripps has gone crazy. Weedering, it's probably the best foot he's played for a little while. Out in front, hey, get us over the line. And then we've seen a few others, you know, like Owies was really good and we've seen Kemp have to do things that he hasn't done. For, not that he's done them every moment of every game, but it's challenged all to stand up. What, what, what concession do you th- I still don't want to give up on that heart and that that heart and soul mentality, regardless of the magnet. Yeah, yeah. So they, they've all held the fort, right? So the the mission of the last two weeks was to hold the fort and get there. Now they, they didn't, as it turned out, but they still got there. So that they and they did play heroically to a degree with what they had out there, and that was you know they, a mixture of reinforcements and seat fillers and all for the idea that. Our, our guys will be back for the first week of the finals. So that's why I wouldn't take, I wouldn't be worried about the threshold of, of a number is 
in your say you've got seven, right? Mm. So how many actually represent a risk? So five are ready to go, no dramas whatsoever. They tick every box, and then two, okay, you got to make a bit of an assessment here as to whether they've had the full workload to be ready to go. So I wouldn't worry about the big number. I remember the same conversation with Luke Beveridge in 2016. Oh, can you really bring them all back at once? Well, yes, you can, because you've been holding the fort, waiting for them to be back. And this has been an all of club thing, not just the blokes who represented. So I wouldn't be worried about that. And but, I would trade in, in heavily. Saying that, Jared, yep. Be Bevo didn't have the concerns with the fitness staff that what Carlton have had. Yeah, that, so they've had a bad run. So of their trust the is year. probably not as good as what the dog's trust would have been. Yeah. So I think you have to have your frontline players back for a frontline game and default to we know we play a, a finals brand of footy. We showed that. Roared through the first couple of finals and set up a six. I would be trading so much on that. We are built for this. And I would put them back in. And we are built for this. You've already proven it. Let's go and do it again. That's where I would be pitching it. Yeah. I, I, look, so I'm with Bucks. No soft tissue risks. So if, if if you're saying to me there's a soft tissue, he's not quite over the hamstring, don't don't even talk to me about that one. But the rest who have had the structural injuries that have that this was the block, they've done the work, they're ready to go. I'm not putting them in the basket. Yeah. I'm just playing them. But I don't think it's ever that – it's never that cut and dry. It's, look, th but, there's an inherent risk in these four guys. They're, they're making their way back from exactly what you're talking about. We're, we're, we're saying it's 90% sold, 10% risk. What do you want to do, Michael? That, that's the challenge. you got four of those individual conversations. So by the time you get to the fourth, you go, not another one at 90-10. Because they're not going to sign off, he's 100% right to go. Because if he goes down the first 15 minutes of the game, you say, hey, mate, you told me he was 100%. You know, that's not going to happen. They, they're, they're going to give you a, a percentage that's not going to satisfy. It's not. So I, I think there is there is a deeper discussion than just we're ready to charge. Because if you lose two, it's over. But And they're going up against it anyway. So so Brisbane, most people will tip Brisbane to win this game comfortably. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're huge underdogs. Yeah. Really. There's never, there's never a free hit. There's never, there really is no, especially not when you're a preliminary finalist last year. Yeah. I don't buy, I don't buy into that. Yeah, well, I don't want to hear anyone say free no. hit. It's a, it's not a free hit. It's, it's, it's a final. You got, you've got to give your, you know, your best effort, obviously. But oh, I just, I just feel like this is conspired against Fossey this back half of the year. Mm. There was a long queue. Who have you put on the pressure index? Well, I think we've got Brisbane in there. It's just, just, it's the old Nike category. Just do it. Just go and get it done. They've just got to be mature enough this week to to be aware of the ambush that Carlton are trying to bring to them um, and be diligent and, and stay you know, focused on task. And I'm sure they will. I, I think this is one of the easier tips of the of the round, really. Brisbane at home, although this year they started out, they, they were wobbly. But they've, they've been bulletproof up there for two to three years, really. So I just I can't see them losing this game. They've just got too much talent and they're too good in order. Um, Chris Fagan, I think the pressure comes deeper in the finals than, than this week. Um, and he doesn't necessarily have to be the reason they win the game. He just can't be the reason they lose it. And I don't see that this week. I don't see Carlton posing those those challenges. It was, I think they had a five-goal lead at quarter time last year in the prelim. So they did they did jump and run. But you would just think that this would be the upset of the week that would shock us all. Yeah. So I, I just think the pressure's there to, to just be diligent enough to get it done. And I know they've got to win four games to win it this year and they'll be on the road after after this. Um, but s such is their lot. So it's going to be a, t it's a tough ask to, to, to win three big finals, including the granny on the road after this. But they've just got to... They need a little bit of luck with injury, obviously, this weekend, but they've just got to get it done. Just full stop. Is their game in good order? Over a long period of time. So the two games they've lost, which ended up costing them a place in the top four, they they had such good positions in those games mm. as you come away and go, so for what they got wrong, and the cost of it has been high, not being in the top four. But they have the long-term form now of nine in a row and two games that they, to a degree, dominated and should have banked. Yeah, They look in as – you could make a case they're in as good a form as anybody. They're easy to fall in love with, absolutely no doubt. I think 
My only reservation, and, and this is really picky, right? And and this is what we do because we we study the games they've lost or or have just won, and have a look at the the when they're trying to save the game, what the mechanics of that are, and are they in working order? Because that in the end has cost them in big games across the last couple of years. The loose man behind the ball, one versus two. How did they end up with two? Is, did someone do the wrong thing? Is it ingrained in them what it should look like? Do they absolutely know who it is? Is it Danaher going behind the ball? Do they free up Andrews or is it Danaher as the loose? Do they do they bring another player back and have Harris Andrews as the loose? Do they know that they've got to keep the ball in at stoppage? Do they absolutely stand in the right positions behind the ball? Um, th- those little – and that's picky, right? But that's going to happen in a final series. I mean, you're going to want to shut the game down just before halftime in, in a prelim. Just get to halftime with a, a one-goal lead. Or you're going to want to be able to do it, as we've seen over the last couple of years, in a, in a big final, grand final, prelim final, with three minutes to go, with five minutes to go. Is five minutes to go the right time or is it three? They're the little things that I think have slipped at Brisbane and they're not absolutely rock solid on. So that that, that for me... I think is it becomes an advantage to the opposition too quickly. Um, so that that's just me. That's that's watching them really laser like, and, and and that can be unfair, right? But this is this is the small margins of of elite level footy. You know, are you, have you have you taught them or have they learned? There's a big difference. You know, do they absolutely know what's required? And that that's where I still have that reservation. Now that he. They know their club better than us. They can say, no, we, we, we're across it. We know it. Well, I didn't get to see it under pressure of the two hours of a weekend. So their view can be different. To, their truth can be different to my truth. But until we see it, we can't, we can't say it's absolutely there. So there were two newspaper articles across the past few days. Have you been too harsh on Chris Fagan? Too harsh on Chris Fagan. Um, well, I think they've had the best list for the last two to three years. And they've, in the main, been super healthy. So is that too harsh? You can make your own decisions. Others say he's done a great – I think he's done a great job to get them from five wins, five wins, whoosh, the big rise, and they've been at the top for what, four years now? So this is their sixth final series, yes. and they went straight to the top four. So the first year I'm saying they're not really a content – they've had the rise, and they're not really a contender. A bit like Hawthorne this year. They're, not, they're there, but are they really a contender? I think next year – you would give them more credit, you know, a credible uh, opportunity to win it than than this. Have I been too harsh? Well, you either win it or you don't. Isn't that isn't that fair? Oh, I don't know about that. I think th- I, I that, that implies there's only one, and there's there's better than the, the, over the other four, seventeen. Five, six don't years. Miss. Yeah. Well, I'm not I'm not here to defend him or, or otherwise, but I just think at some point you've got to win. I mean, you're going to have this generation of opportunity. A footy generation is five or six years. And so this, and if yeah. You, yeah. If you have a generation with this level of talent, you've got to win them. I mean, we don't talk about runners-up. We don't. We don't. We, and, and it can be a very good coach and not have won one, but you can't be a great coach if you haven't won one. You just can't be. So uh, are we too hard on him? I, I just think there's been reasons why they've conspired to some of those losses. That That's my view. And they can be – upset with that or they can they can say that's not right but we can sit and watch the game together and we can do the grand final together again and, and point out a few things that hurt them really hurt them um you know even we're even tactically picking apart the nick Dacos second quarter last week well why are we doing that so they're the little things that sit with me i don't judge them against the also rens we just judge them in the big games They're there. Should they be top four? You can argue. They started slowly. They've recovered. They've played some pretty good footy. But this is this is AFL footy, mate. It's crunch time in September. You either fire up or you don't. So I'm not here to defend him, or 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 really go after him. But the question was asked during the middle of the year: Why wouldn't Tasmania get Chris Scott? I said, Well, if Chris Scott's up for grabs, I know where he'd be. He'd win you a flag, and that's at Brisbane. You got a very good coach that could be replaced by a great coach. That was the discussion. Now, they've, they've taken offence to that. I've got no problem with that. It's a big boys comp. If that offends you, well, so be it. But you've got to win them, Jared. So we, we, we'll talk about Chris Scott later on, and we'll give him a chance going to Adelaide. Why? With an inferior lineup. Why? Because he gets it done. Because he gives us evidence that shows us he can orchestrate the game the way he wants, and then they, they win those games, those big games. So that, that's my point. 
I'm, I'm not here to necessarily uh, authenticate coaches, but do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just get it done. Brisbane Lions, pressure index. So the big issue, Carlton, pressure index, Brisbane. Let's go to Thursday night, shall we? So two parts to this, maybe Geelong first. Is that open question? Is can Chris concoct a plan to shut down Port Adelaide's midfield? Well, the way he sets it up, you, you, so go, I went back and had a look at last time they played. Okay, so last time they played, they jumped out to almost a 50 point lead. It was lead. incredible. It was unreal, wasn't Down it? Down at Geelong. Everything they did turn, uh, turned into scores, turned into goals. And their clearance game was just ridiculous, just off the charts. Um, I think they kicked something like three centre bounce goals in the first quarter. Now, you're, you're lucky to get one, one and a half a game on average. They got three and a quarter of footy. That doesn't happen against Geelong. And then, and then they were able to. They were able to wrestle the game back to long and ran it to within a goal. And it was it makes you think if they can just defend clearance. So not necessarily win. They got Patrick Dangerfield in there this time, who wasn't there last. So I I don't know. I I I just don't know. Was he, I'm trying to think, was he there last time or not? Uh, uh no. I'll I'll get that for you. I don't think he was. I don't think he was, but I'd have to check that. So the I just think the way Chris will set this game up is for slingshot footy. Is that he'll say, okay, we're not going to get beaten by Horn Francis and, and Butters at clearance. They, they're not to come out the front. If they, if they win the ball, they win the ball. Well, we can win it back at half back or back in our D50 and then go. So that, that's, that's where they pose an immediate threat. Aaliyah can't travel with Jeremy Cameron. He can't, he can't, he can't go at that speed. He can't go for 120 metre runs which he puts him to every time. you got Myers, Stengel, uh, Close, Dempsey, all charging back. So that, that's where they can become a frightening uh, proposition. Um, so I think, I think that would worry Ken, and, but that, that is the beauty of Chris. He sets the game up for the flankers. Now, th these two midfielders, well, these three midfielders with Rosie might just rip the heart out of the game. I, I, I do hear people talking about Rosie going to half back. I think that would be an error because you've got to, you've actually got to defend these guys. Really difficult when they come at speed to go back, and you're giving up a playmaker who's a centre forward star. So can he do it? Of course he. Can. I, I can't wait for Thursday night. For the, that's the one for me this weekend that has all the all the trimmings of a, of another ambush. We talked about the ambush when he went to Fremantle to get that job done. You just know that if you give this guy two weeks to plan for, for one given task, that he can get it done. Yeah, so Dangerfield wasn't there in the round yes, 10 match. he wasn't there. So he's back in. So that changes that midfield head-to-head, -head, doesn't it? It does. It does. Then the other side of the coin. So the, the, the worst bit has happened to Port Late, who got themselves to a position where they were so well set, and then the two players that they've lost at the end. So disarmed yeah. Ken. Yeah. Uh, I, re I really feel for Ken. Because this this was the one, you know, this, this, the the moment from uh, Houston that, that he'd love back and, and and Farrell to do a, a bad hamstring and and be done. It's just it's just it's crushing, really, because they're they're too the way they want to play. So the way they want to play is corridor, is aggression, is is attacking, you know, through the eye of a needle. We're going at you, we're coming at you. Now you lose the two best kicks in the team. That, that's cruel. That's crushing, isn't it? So you can't replace those players, really. You sort of can't. You can't replace them as defensively diligent and offensively brutal, which is what Houston is. Farrell gives up a little bit defensively, but you, you wear a little bit because he's so good with the ball. So what? What do you try and replace? What? What do you look to do? Do you keep your strategy in the way you play? So you go with aggression. So there's the Rosie discussion to halfback. We need to still do this. Or do you say, well, let's just hold up behind the ball. Let's just let's just pick the defensive types and see if we can get them a clearance and see if we can just dominate and, and play the territory game. So that, that's the beauty. I don't know which way Ken will go. We, we don't know till Thursday, really. And whatever works, and there's a whole heap of player performance and everything to, to, to go into that. But I just feel like he's been disarmed a little bit with you know, the big month of September to come. Which way would you be inclined to go? Uh, I think you've got to modify your aggression and not lose the game on turnover is probably my starting point. If, if you, Geelong are not going to defeat themselves. So if you give them luxuries on turnover in corridor, they'll have the smalls that'll hurt you. 
Um, so I would pick the defensive types rather than the offensive. It looked terrific. If you put if you put some star factor players at half, it always looks great on the board. But is that the reality? When the ball's coming at speed, he's got to go to Myers or make a decision or go to Stengel or, geez, Jeremy Cameron's forward of Valier. So much happening so quickly. You get it wrong, you're in trouble. Yep. And do you think Port's midfield, is that the determining factor? Yeah, it is. Oh, look at it. They could just they could just rip the game away from them. I just don't see that happening with Dangerfield in there. You know, just watching, and it's a deeper discussion we we're going to have probably Wednesday night. Just watching the top dozen midfielders in the comp at the moment, they're all so clean. Like there's no, there's no two two grabbers, there's no fumblers. The top dozen are just bang ball one. So you only get one chance at clearance at the moment with with the best teams. I'm not worried about the rest. So Lockie Neal, bang, it's gone. It's out, done. Dangerfield, boom, it's gone. So they're all they're all giving you one opportunity to win the ball, and then it's gone. So if Port can do that, Hall Francis has been in great form. Mm. You know, Zach Butters has ripped the heart out of teams in the last month. So I just I do think that they could do it and get the game played in their forward half. But I think that's the way they have to do it. They have to win a glut of clearances in a, in, a, in bursts to um, to get it on the scoreboard because in general play, I think the Cats will get them. Well, let's um, pin our debate for New Vision Clinics, New Vision Clinics Keyhole Laser Vision Next Generation Technology on Friday night where it's as stacked an elimination final as I can think of as the Bulldogs and the Hawks are going to come together. Kingy, what's what's your central premise here? Well, do good big men beat good small men, or is it the reverse? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we have the answer, and we won't know the answer until Friday night, but it's a shame that these two are playing each other, but they are, and yeah, the Hawks have been able to play a breakneck speed out of the back line. You know, the, 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 the constant sprint work of Jarm and Impey and these guys off half back is remarkable. And it doesn't really matter whether you've got great positioning behind the ball because in an instant you, you just got this wave coming at you. You've got to locate your man who's charging sideways and backwards towards goal. So you, you, you're forced to make a decision almost straight away against Hawthorne. And if you get it wrong, it goes to your man out the back. And if you get it right, well, you're in the gut. You're in the hunt to... to to at least make the contest. So I, I love how they're playing. Massive fan of what they're doing around the, the footy with um, Newcomb and, and and Warple and Big Meeky in there doing his thing. Um, so they've been really good at forward 50 uh, stoppages and those sorts of things. So they're, they're in really good form. And then and then I watched the the Dogs in a must-win game up at Ballarat, and that was uh, pretty tough conditions, you know, all on the line. You could, you could just feel there was a tension in the stadium up there um, last week, and then, and they come through with flying colours, and and they just they played with a, a ferocity and a pressure that the Giants couldn't handle. Now they were undermanned, but they, they really couldn't couldn't handle and they couldn't function. So uh, watching that game, I, was, I saw Beveridge, even though there was a four goal breeze going to the right of screen, he was reluctant to put a loose man behind the ball. He just said, "No, one on one, you fight your own fight." And I just thought, is that an eye to the future? If they are to win this game, well, then at least they're going to play the way that he's going to ask them to play going forward. So I think they've been set up really well to, to compete. And then they've just got these these freak forwards, like Jamar is in really good touch. You've got Aaron Norton's had a, a terrific back half of the season. And Darcy just marks the ball at a height that others just can't just can't get to. Don't know whether he's going to kick 5-1 or 1-5. And there's some, there's some beauty in that for us. Um, as as neutrals, um, but it's just it's just how do you stop the asset of the hawk speed of ball movement and then that small forward line being able to hit the scoreboard, and then the reverse of how do you stop the talls if they do kick those high balls in? Do you have a philosophical leaning towards big man, small man, particularly in cutthroat finals? Oh, I, th- I think night game you probably tend to go with small men be- because. They can offer a bit more if they're not if they're not marking the ball. The tools they really don't offer much else, and the smalls can he can be moved around. He, he does spin the magnets a lot, Sam Mitchell. So you you can do other things for the team if you if you're able to be uh, mobile and and uh, you got your running game on. But um, no, it's it's almost impossible to tip this one really. 
And I, I just wonder whether there's any is, – is there a shock move from one – I mean, the midfield of the Dogs bats a bit deeper than the Hawks, I feel. And they've got – if you watch John Newcomb, I, I, I went and watched – I told you, Jerry, I've had a very quiet few days. Watched a bit of tape of Jai. His movements are not dissimilar to Bontempelli's at stoppage. They're very similar. They're very similar modes, very similar actions. Now, Bond has the reach. He has the those long arms that disrupt and, and tap the ball on and all those sorts of things that Jai doesn't do. I'm not saying they're the same player, but their movements and their, their, their flow into stoppage is very similar. So I'm sort of saying, okay, at stoppage – You'd say Bond has the slight edge, but only slight. Who's next? Then you've got Libba. Then you've got Trelaw. Then you've got Richards. It just keeps going. I don't know if the Hawks bat as deep. So I, th- I think the Dogs will get them at the coal face, and then it's w- whether you can hold up against the Tolls. If you can, it's gone at speed. There's no way that Darcy, Norton, and Jamar will be able to chase those guys. So it'll be a foot rate. It'll be a track meet out of there. So that, that, that's exciting for us. I don't know who wins. Again, it's down to performance. But they, you would think that the dogs would get first opportunity with the ball going their forward line, and if they don't take it, strap yourself in. Adams posed the differentiator. Hawthorne's played virtually no footy at night. The dogs play so little at the MCG and how you weigh those two factors as they come together at a, a, as a, on a Friday night at the G. Well, night games, they're just different, aren't they? It's just a different build-up. It's, you know, from, from a player point of view, an individual point of view, it's a long day to the start of a, a night game. Like, how do you get your mind off footy? How do, you, how do you not burn yourself out before you get to the venue? And then, you know, just, it is different. It, it's different. You feel like the crowd's upon you a bit more. You've, you, you know, you, you've, you do, it's just a, a different feeling, I think. Um I don't know if it has any massive relevance on how they play. How they play is not going to alter because it's a night game, because it's that free-flowing you know, speed battle. Does it affect the dogs? Being a night game might be a bit more due. Might, yeah, we, are we going to get a good night? Who knows? The weather will be important, no doubt. Someone's just sent through wet weather on yeah, Friday. For the moment, it's a wet forecast. Is but that this right? is Melbourne and it's only Monday. <laughs> <laughs> when did we get last night's forecast? <laughs> and And... The other part of the debate is how far could the winner of this match go? I think that's the most enticing part. That's why it's a pity that they are meeting now because they both feel like they've got such significant roles to play, but for one of them, they don't make it out of Friday night. The other carries the torch, and it's a torch that might get carried a long way. Yeah, where do you see it finishing? Where do you... I have, I've had the imagination for Hawthorne in a preliminary final for months, but... Um, I would I would rate the dogs even higher than that in the role that they've got to play in this season. Yeah, I, look, I've been a huge believer in the dogs. We, we've, you've probably been Hawthorne what I've been for the dogs. I reckon I haven't been as I haven't been as enamoured with Hawthorne as, as yourself. I probably thought about their um, I thought about their clearance game midpoint of the year that was really strong, and there were some areas that needed some work. And then it's all fallen into place for them. They're playing some some high level footy, but I just feel like the dogs have been here most most of the year, and they're, they're throwing a shocker. They're throwing a, a game that you think, "Wow, I didn't." You know, is that really them? Or you know, every time they went to the Port Adelaide game was the one. They're just uncompetitive. You think is that likely to bump in a, in a final? Um, but I, I'm a, I'm a big believer in Bevo, and people ask me why, and it's hard to explain why. I just think his his ability to get them on a run for three to four weeks has has always been evident, and I feel like he's doing that again. Better placed than 2016. Better placed, uh, well, yeah. Have you seen the forward line that won it for him yeah, in 2016? They're better stocked. They're than better stocked. There's, there there are less reasons why they couldn't this year than what they were mm. what they were in 2016. Yep, I feel like we're we're alike. On this front. Preliminary final integrity, they got that right. We're allocating these to the Giants and the Swarms. If we run the high end measure across the Giants, they were beaten last year in the preliminary final by a point. They had integrity. They were just a whisker away. It's the scenario that Collingwood rode to a flag the following year. How do you see the Giants stacking up as they come back to a final series? I think the most impressive asset for the Giants is what they do with their pressure game without the footy. And they have had that for quite a uh, sustained period now. Best team in the competition without the footy in terms of their pressure. And when you when you see it, it, it is just a commitment to charge the play with the ball. 
So as soon as you take possession, boom, they're on top of your you know, frontal pressure and then coming from everywhere. Now, if you can handle that. So the last time they played them, the Swans, it was a fascination because I think they kicked they kicked something like eight goals in the second quarter, Sydney, because they, they handled it. They were, they, they were able to do two things. Take it out of pressure by finding that first mark. If you can find that first mark, game's out of pressure, you can take away the GWS game. But Sydney have been a little bit run and gun the last couple of weeks. So you've seen a bit more handball games. So you've got to be able to handle to steal one of Ken's, handle the heat. If you can handle the heat and get through that first or second handball in good order, you can have some fun. You can get to the outside. You can get to corridor. You can get the ball back to Heaney, uh, Warner, Goulden. If they can get it back to the key three, and McInerney coming back in is part of that as well. He's a star. So if, if they can get the ball to those guys, they'll score. Um, doesn't matter who's forward of the ball. And whether you like them or you don't, that, they'll, they'll have high quality. So that's the game. So GWS have to stick that first tackle. They have to force that early turnover. Because as soon as it becomes a, a chain and as soon as they find a mark, oh, that's the swan. They're in, you're in swans mode. So it'll flip and flop as you're watching the game. You'll say, well, it's favours GWS right now, ball bobbling, initially taking possession. Whoosh. Can you handle it? It's almost hold your breath for a sec. Yeah, we're through. Or turnover, ball spills, or surge kick back to those uh, dominant um, GWS defenders, and then away they go. I don't think the Giants' run and gun game has been as good as years gone by. It's been a little bit clunky and, and, and heavily uh, reliant upon the, the, the kicking form of, of Lockie Whitfield. It just hasn't been the same out of the back line. So I do think they'll have to force turnover further up the field than what they have in the past. Um, and that'll be a challenge because Sydney don't beat themselves. They're a bit like Geelong. that You've, you've actually got to go and get everything right against them to beat them. And I know we talked a lot in the back half of the year about disarming Sydney by dominating Corridor, I think that they've, they've altered slightly and become more of a handballing team that doesn't just look for that kick into the Corridor as much as what they did in the mid, mid-year mid sort of period. Would Jesse Hogan worry Sydney? Uh, would he? Well, I think McCartan's got a pretty good record. I think he kicked, kept him to one or two last time they played. I want to say one, but probably I don't want to be wrong. So just say one or two. It wasn't it wasn't anything influential, so that can be the team, uh, you know, yep. allowing dirty ball and all those sorts of things, dominating possession. The first quarter was a real arm wrestle, and then and then they blew them away. So I, I don't know, I don't have the answer, but he's a good matchup for him, and they won't be confused by. There's one thing with the John Lomai coach team, is that they'll know their tasks, and that's yours. So don't get confused by the run around and the handover and all those sorts of things. McCartan will play on on Hogan. Um, and outside of Hogan, if their pressure game was slightly off, who would win it for them? Who would win it for the Giants is, is my question. I know there's a lot of smalls up there, you know, Daniels and Green and um, Jones and all these guys bobbling around doing their thing. But outside of that, I mean, Tom Green's going to win a, win some clearance, but is there enough damage on that clearance? That I feel like they I feel like they're – one trump card short at the moment, but looking to see it. You know, we'll be up there for that game on Saturday. Looking forward to seeing who, who that next trump card is. So Hogan kicked just the one goal, as you referenced. Yeah. Took two marks last time. The previous meeting earlier the year, he kicked two goals, one. Yeah, he's he's a good matchup for him. They've got similar attributes, really. He he he's a good size matchup for him. But but Jesse. Yeah, you just you sort of hope. We hope this story continues through a final series, don't we? I'd love, I'd love to see Jesse kick twenty goals for the final series, you yeah. know, and just be the reason, because it'd just be a great story for footy, and we need great stories. But yeah, who knows? Again, it comes back on a performance. But I just feel like the only way the Giants can win is with their pressure game forcing turnover high up the field, instant turnover if you like, and then away they go. And they got that right. So the Swans laid the foundation to all of this so early in the season. They've led it since round eight, which is a hard position to be in. We do spend a lot of time waiting for when it truly matters. Their best footies a while ago. So they live the journey that Collingwood lived last year. 
and then Collingwood returned to their best footy on the last day when it mattered most. So what's your read on Sydney going in? Yeah, they've been hiding in plain sight, haven't they? I mean, we've, we've all looked at them, we've all picked them apart. They haven't had the, they didn't have the juice for four or five weeks there to really, you know, they were happy to engage and freewheel a little bit, but they didn't, re, didn't really have absolute buy-in to, to get the job done every week. Like, you know what it'll have this week. And they're at full health. You know, Papley will come back and McInerney will come back and McCartan will come back into the team and there's one other that escapes me. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I can't think there's four to come back. But anyway, they're, they're going to pick their top 23 rated players. What, what, a, what an unbelievable luxury that yeah. is at the start of the year to be able to do that. So no, I, I'll, I'm on board the Swan. I think this is John Longmire's second premiership right upon us now. He's been to the, the big... The big dance, as we call it now, Jared, uh, four times, as we we always refer to it as. But he's been in the grand final four times and been disappointed three of the four, and and humbled early in a couple of them. Um, so I think this is the one. They're in really good health, got a great system, got got great talent, you know, a lot of all Australian caliber players in there that have been recognised by all. Ready for the moment. Luke Parker was the one that we were, was a mystery to us all. Where's he going to play? What's he going to do? He's been outstanding and is now a prime piece for them within within a matter of space of, what, four to six weeks. He, he, are they, they going to make him earn it again? Is he coming back by the VFL? Straight in, bang. So I, I just I can just see them. I can see them getting on a charge. And this is a big step, isn't it, having lost the, pre, the three previous finals to the Giants. Has yeah. set things right in your own backyard and booked the Sydney prelim. Yeah, Heaney was the other one. Sorry, of course it was. Oh, he, yes. He had the, he had the rest rest of, off. Yeah, yeah, rested. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. Rich, Thanks Pete, for that. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so this this sets up for Sydney. You're just not going to get a better opportunity. And, and there's, you know, there's a high likelihood they play an interstate, a, another, a non-MCG tenant grand final day if they can get there. It changes all the numbers. Changes all the numbers and likelihood for success. So... Good luck, Swannies. Yeah, give me a final view on where we ended up with the Christian Petrarca scenario, what we lived through. Uh, no winners. No winners again in these sorts of discussions. Uh, a, a club that has been given a whack across the knuckles from top down. Uh, I, I'd expect change. I don't think you can roll on given the levels of in, inadequacy that they've had over the last six to eight weeks. So someone has to pay a price for that. You're an elite organisation in a small margin business, you can't be you can't have these own goals. That that's for their administration to work out how that should look. And if you really love the club, well, maybe you shouldn't be there. Sometimes you got to you got to look internally. So have I done the best job that this position demands? And I think, you know, not many people will be asking to come onto your show and do an interview, Jared, going forward because I think Kate had a bad a bad morning last Thursday, and just exposed all warts. And in the end, your top five or six players need to be treated differently. They do. That, that's forever and a day been the case. That they, Maybe they ask more of your time and maybe they demand a bit more, but they're your best five or six assets. The business runs off game day performance, and if you want to impact that at all, have them happy and charging game day. Um, they just made too many mistakes, Melbourne. Petrarca, did he hold himself in the right manner? I don't think – I think – He's got overs for what he's done, and and maybe you could do things slightly different. But there's no easy way to tell someone they're ugly, and that's what he's done to his footy club. Yeah, and now it's all resolved before they all go in their different directions, which I think is incredibly useful. So instead of hemorrhaging for six weeks or two weeks there, and then they're all trying to come back together in November, they actually have the opportunity to all be together now. And those lines of communication never broke down anyway, peer to peer. So within the player group. That's easy. So I doubt there's much healing to be do to be done there. I think there's a lot of healing to be done uh, more broadly than that, but I doubt there's much healing within the player group that wouldn't be sorted out probably already. But even if there is, I think some of the reasons are valid. I don't know all of them. None of us know all of them. I think the speculation from outside has been wild. But we don't, we don't know all of them. But even if there are some things that need to be sorted out, you're best friends with these guys. Like, best friends fight and they get on with it and they get over it. Partners fight and you get over it and you get on with it. Like, it's, it's a short-term thing. 
in terms of rebuilding that connection, that relationship, and at least you know that he's challenging everyone in the business to get better. All right. How do you want to approach the seedings? Is there a correct way? No. It's whichever way you like. All right. Well, at four, I'm going to put the Brisbane Lions. I, I still think they're too good to just dismiss. Yep. They'll get the job done this week and we'll be talking about them, you know, getting on the road in the next few weeks next Monday. I'm just going to leave them in there. I've got the Brisbane Lions at four mm. as well. I think their footy absolutely stacks up. Well, you've left one of my top three out then. Cause three? Because I've got the Hawks high. GWS. I think they've got they got a big opportunity this week to really put a you know a flag in the ground and and charge. I just I don't think they're firing on all cylinders, but they've just got they've got talent everywhere. And this little bloke who's 182 centimeters plays centre half forward that just can do anything in a final series. Toby Green, they're waiting for him to go gangbusters. Yep. And I've just I'm not going to put a line through them until they're absolutely without a pulse. I've got Sydney at three. Huge scope. Just want to see it. Just want to see Saturday. Two. Western Bulldogs. I'm I'm still sticking with the dogs. I know that things could open up for them if they can um, get through the Hawks. The Hawks are the biggest of challenges on Friday night, no doubt. I've just got unbelievable faith that their leaders will fire again. Bont and Pelly in, in ripping form. Their tall forwards are a point of difference that if they really get rolling, no one will match. I've got Hawthorne at two. Who have you got at one? The Sydney Swans. All things being equal, they win this week and health is your best player. I've got the dogs at one. Only one one or two are going to survive my seedings. (laughs)